welcome Mason Watson to the battle brief for this month and uh, glad to have you with us. Let me uh, give a little introduction to Dr. Watson. He received a BA in history from the College of William and Mary and a PhD in military history from the finest military history program in the country, Ohio State University. He's been a member of the U.S. Army Center of Military History uh, since 2017. We almost overlapped. Uh, I was there till 2017, but we've connected over the past few months and glad to, glad to do that. Uh, Dr. Watson is a specialist in the history of World War I and co-authored a commemorative pamphlet on the Second Battle of the Marne as part of the Army Center of Military History's commemorative series on uh, the uh, uh, anniversary of World War I. He's currently writing the full-length official history of the U.S. Army in Operation Inherent Resolve. So we're glad to get him. Uh, Mason, welcome this evening. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Well, John, thank you very much for that introduction. It's uh, great to be here. We don't uh, cover a lot of modern operations on the Battle Brief, so I'm glad we're doing it tonight and uh, glad to have you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you again. Uh, so uh, this presentation um, gives an, an overview of the battle for the northern Iraqi city of Mosul, uh, it, uh, it, which was fought between the Iraqi security forces assisted by a U.S.-led coalition and uh, the terrorist group known as the Islamic State or ISIS. Uh, lasting nine months and uh, involving more than 100,000 combatants, it was one of the largest bloodiest and most destructive urban battles in uh, recent history. It was ISIS's last stand on Iraqi soil, uh, the Iraqi military's greatest victory, arguably, uh, since 1988, and uh, the capstone of the U.S. Army's most successful security force assistance effort since the Korean War. Uh, despite its obvious importance, the battle for Mosul remains poorly understood. Uh, it is perhaps sufficient to note um, that the most uh, detailed operational account available to the public uh, is found on Wikipedia. Uh, traditional sources offer little information, uh, mainly because official account, uh, records are inaccessible to most researchers. Um, but while the vast majority of official documents remain classified, uh, much more can be said without delving into secret records. Uh, drawing on interviews with participants uh, a range of unclassified official documents in my own uh, recently published monograph on uh, CMH monograph on Operation Inherent Resolve. Uh, this presentation provides an, an operational overview of the campaign to liberate Iraq's second largest city. Uh, so I'll begin with some background on the combatants and on the situation in Iraq in 2016 when the battle started. I'll then provide a survey of the uh, course of the battle, highlighting several important aspects. Uh, and finally, I'll conclude with uh, some general observations. So in the first place, to, to understand the battle for Mosul, um, it's nece necessary to understand the uh, so-called Islamic State. Uh, ISIS traces its origins to the terrorist group that was founded by uh, the Jordanian-born jihadist Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, uh, pictured here on the left. Uh, after 2003, when the U.S. invasion invaded Iraq, Zarqawi's organization, which was known successively as the Group of Monotheism and Jihad, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI, and the Islamic State of Iraq, or ISI, was one of the deadliest and most brutal insurgent organizations opposed to the U.S.-led occupation of Iraq. Uh, it quickly became infamous for releasing graphic footage of executions on the internet and for carrying out high-profile terrorist attacks on, on Iraqi civilians. Uh, the overwhelming majority of whom were other Muslims that ISIS uh, branded uh, illegitimately as uh, heretics. Uh, adherents of Shiism or Shias, a, a group that uh, constituted the majority of Iraq's population were among Zarqawi's primary targets. Uh, this was a source of friction with the central Al-Qaeda organization under Osama bin Laden, pictured here on the, on the right, um, which prioritized uh, fighting against the so-called far enemy uh, that is to say the West and specifically the United States. Uh, although Zarqawi's group fought U.S. forces, it focused its efforts on attacks targeting Shias 
whom it designated as the uh, near enemy. Uh, the intent behind this was to provoke Shia militias into indiscriminate reprisals that would, uh, as Zarqawi hoped, compel Sunnis in Iraq to align with his group as uh, the champion of their cause. Ultimately, uh, AQI could take credit for helping to spark a, a sectarian civil war beginning in 2006, uh, but its extreme ideology ensured that it never enjoyed broad popularity among the Sunni Iraqis that it claimed to represent. Uh, this unpopularity proved to be a key vulnerability that U.S. forces were able to exploit. By 2010, Zarqawi uh, had died at the hands of U.S. Special Operations Forces, uh, and the organization he had founded was on the verge of defeat. Uh, two events in 2010, however, gave uh, AQI, uh, which was headed since uh, uh, two events in 2011, sorry, gave AQI, which was headed since 2010 by an obscure religious scholar named Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, an opportunity to stage a comeback. Uh, the first was the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, which was completed in December. Uh, the second was the outbreak of the Syrian civil war, a result of the Assad regime's brutal response to the Arab Spring protest movement. After taking advantage of the chaos in Syria to rebuild its organization and gather new recruits, uh, the group rebranded itself as the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, or ISIS, and launched a renewed offensive against the Iraqi government in early 2014 that left it in, the, in control of about one third of, of Iraq in a similar sized portion of Syria, ultimately. Uh, incidentally, so in the center here is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, he was not going by this name when uh, that, that photograph was taken. He was actually detained by US forces uh, for about a year in 2004. Uh, and this map here shows ISIS at, a, at basically its largest extent. Um, you can see that uh, its territory stretched from uh, close to Baghdad and Iraq all the way to the outskirts of Aleppo in Syria. Uh, it's about the size of Kentucky um, and uh, around 11 million people were under its rule. Uh, having achieved this, uh, this, this uh, remarkable rapid expansion at the end of June, uh, 2014, ISIS uh, announced that it had reestablished the Sunni Caliphate. Uh, Baghdadi assumed the title of Caliph in a ceremony in Mosul's uh, 12th century Grand Al Nuri Mosque. Uh, and here he is uh, in that uh, ceremony in, in uh, July uh, uh, 2014 in the top left. Um, American combat troops returned to Iraq over the summer of 2014 to assess the Iraqi Security Forces, or ISF. Uh, what they found was disappointing. Although the United States had spent eight years and about $25 billion building the Iraqi military virtually from the ground up, uh, it had disintegrated almost immediately when confronted with a determined opponent. At Mosul in June 2014, about 1,500 ISIS fighters riding in pickup trucks routed two entire Iraqi divisions. By the end of the year, 19 Iraqi army brigades and six federal police brigades had ceased to exist. As one US officer later recalled, senior Iraqi leaders, quote, seemed to be lacking in confidence. Most of the Iraqi generals could not even look me in the eye. ISIS seemed unstoppable to them. Rebuilding the ISF would take time and success was by no means guaranteed. But there was no political appetite, uh, either in uh, Washington or in Baghdad, for sending American ground troops to uh, fight ISIS, raising a new they're raising new Iraqi units and supporting them with trainers, advisors, and firepower, uh, both in the air and on the ground, appeared to offer the best path forward. Operation Inherent Resolve, or OIR, as the new campaign against the Islamic State was designated, would therefore be an exercise essentially in proxy warfare. Uh, the US, at least on the ground, uh, the US and coalition allies would fight uh, ISIS on the ground by, with, and through local partners like the Iraqi security forces. A new headquarters, Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, or CJTF OIR, was established to oversee the campaign in October 2014. In the meantime, air power would help to keep ISIS at bay. Uh, U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM, carried out its first airstrikes against ISIS in Iraq in August. Airstrikes in Syria began in September. Uh, the airplanes uh, you know, pictured here uh, actually participated in those first airstrikes in Syria. Uh, here they are uh, just after refueling over northern Iraq. 
Um, in the two years between the establishment of CJTF OIR and the opening of the Mosul counteroffensive, the Iraqis, uh, with heavy coalition support, liberated a large part of their country, including the cities of Tikrit, Ramadi, and Fallujah. Uh, and you can see here in green the territory uh, that uh, CJTF OIR helped its partners to, to liberate during that time. Meanwhile, ISIS suffered remorseless attrition, uh, losing tens of thousands of fighters, many of them to coalition airstrikes. Uh, but the ISF sustained heavy losses, including 4,700 casualties in the battles uh, for Ramadi and Fallujah alone. And they moved very slowly, despite their often uh, overwhelming numerical superiority. Uh, Ramadi, for example, uh, took uh, eight months to secure even though Iraqi forces in the city outnumbered ISIS's defenders uh, by between 16 to 1 to uh, 25 to 1. Uh, the campaign to liberate Mosul, a city several times the size of Ramadi, uh, promised uh, to be much more difficult. Here, uh, here we see Mosul from the, the West Bank looking, uh, looking east. The capital of Iraq's northwestern Nineveh province, Mosul had been one of the country's most populous cities, with more than 1.5 million inhabitants uh, before it fell to ISIS in 2014. And while perhaps as many as a third of the city's residents chose to flee rather than live under the caliphate, it remained a major population center. In better times, it was quite diverse uh, with sizable and well-established Christian and, and Kurdish minorities. However, uh, Mosul's inhabitants, especially the Sunni Arabs who constituted a majority of the population, also had a reputation for uh, for conservatism. Between 2003 and 2011, uh, the city had in fact been a center of resistance to the US-led occupation. As one American commander noted in 2010, if AQI, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq had a Pentagon, it would be in Mosul. In terms of geographic extent, uh, it was slightly smaller than Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, five bridges connected the city's eastern and western halves, which lay on opposite banks of the Tigris River. The dominant feature of West Mosul was the old city uh, off uh, here on the left, which was characterized by sturdy stone buildings and narrow winding alleyways. East Mosul, on the other hand, featured more recent construction uh, with less durable concrete and rebar structures built after 1970. It contains several residential neighborhoods, industrial districts, and a uh, university campus. In October, 2016, the ISIS forces in and around Mosul consisted of approximately 4,500 to 7,500 fighters, including as many as 1,000 foreign fighters who had traveled from abroad to support the caliphate. Their way of war represented a hybrid of conventional and unconventional or terrorist methods. They made use of indirect fire and maneuvered around the battlefield in squad and platoon sized groups, often showing skill and combined arms tactics that surpassed that of their Iraqi opponents. Uh, but they also spearheaded attacks with suicide vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, uh, which we gave the acronym SVBIDS. Uh, these served as a kind of primitive precision-guided munition. Uh, and here are a couple of specimens that were captured in uh, the battle uh, for Mosul, and uh, they were often described as Mad Max-type vehicles, and you can see why. Uh, uh, now, many ISIS fighters were fanatics with what one study has called a win-win mindset. Uh, assured that to kill in jihad is a blessing, but uh, uh, death in battle would also lead to paradise. Uh, one American advisor in Mosul described ISIS's capabilities in the following terms, quote, it's a very unconventional threat, uh, but it's still a combined arms army that we're up against. It's got artillery pieces. It has machine guns, rocket, pel rocket propelled grenades, and forward observers. It has close combat aviation. If you look at an unmanned aerial vehicle that's dropping 40 millimeter bomblets, uh, end quote. Their qualities made them a very formidable adversary, a near peer uh, to the ISF, in fact. ISIS's forces would uh, benefit from a system of defensive works that were prepared during the Islamic State's two and a half year occupation of Mosul. The city's dense urban areas noted one US report provided a seemingly unlimited number of opportunities for ISIS to create a near unass unassailable defense in depth. Concrete barriers and disabled vehicles blocked roadways 
and created kill zones where improvised explosive devices could inflict maximum damage. Fortified buildings served as defensive strong points. Many of these structures, including facilities like hospitals, were also rigged to explode. To facilitate movements around the city without drawing the attention of the coalition's aerial surveillance assets, ISIS fighters knocked wormholes in the walls of adjacent structures and constructed an extensive tunnel network, turning entire blocks into continuous interconnected fighting positions. Underground tunnels additionally provided shelter from coalition fires. The Islamic State also sought to deter airstrikes or at the least score propaganda victories against the, the coalition by using the city's civilian population as human shields. It was a defense, according to one senior coalition commander, quote, that any Western army would have a hard time penetrating. To take Mosul, the Iraqis mustered a force consisting of 95,000 troops, including 65,000 from the Iraqi army, counterterrorism service, and federal police, each part of a separate government ministry, and 30,000 from the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Popular Mobilization Forces, a grouping of mainly Shia militias. Staff Lieutenant General Abdul Amir Yarala exercised overall command of the Iraqi troops, although neither the Popular Mobilization Forces nor the Peshmerga were directly subordinate to him. These forces were divided into several axes, each of which consisted of troops drawn primarily from one or the other service. The CTS and the federal police, for example, each advanced independently on Mosul along their own axes. Coordination between these elements was limited at best. The coalition forces in theater operated under a parallel command structure. At the top was General Joseph L. Votel, the combatant commander of the Tampa, Florida-based U.S. Central Command. As combined forces commander for OIR, General Votel synchronized the air, ground, and Tier 1 special operations forces engaged in operations against the Islamic State. Reporting directly to Central Command was CJTF OIR headquarters, which had the majority of its staff at Camp Arif John Kuwait. As of October 2016, a U.S. Army headquarters element deploying for a 12-month rotation had served as the nucleus for every iteration of CJTF OIR. On August 21st, the 18th Airborne Corps, led by Lieutenant General Stephen J. Townsend, relieved Lieutenant General Sean B. McFarland's Third Corps as CJTF OIR headquarters. Under Townsend were two, two main elements, as you can see here, a ground forces command built around an Army Division headquarters and a Special Operations Task Force. Most American advisors supporting the Mosul Offensive came from a brigade combat team attached to the Land Component Command uh, headquarters. However, the advisors working with the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service reported to CJTF OIR's Special Operations Joint Task Force. Most of the Iraqi Axis commanders, mainly major generals commanding divisions, were advised by the Brigade Combat Team's battalion commanders, who led Officer Heavy Advise and Assist Task Forces. Some of these battalions' companies were assigned to advise Iraqi brigades. As a rule, advisors did not accompany their Iraqi partners, but rather remained at secure bases far behind the front lines, a force protection measure that would be relaxed as the offensive dragged on. And uh, here we have some of the, the uh, major coalition leaders. On the top right is the Iraqi Prime Minister, al -Abadi. On the left is the uh, Iraqi uh, Lieutenant General who commanded the offensive, uh, General Abdul Amir. And on the bottom right, is uh, Lieutenant, then Lieutenant General Stephen Townsend, commanding uh, CJTF OIR. Now, an essential preliminary to the offensive uh, to retake Mosul was Operation Valley Wolf, the capture of the city of Kiara and its nearby military airfield known as Q-West. Uh, located about 60 kilometers south of Mosul, uh, the uh, former US forward operating base at Q-West would serve as a staging area and a logistics hub uh, during the assault on the city. Beginning in April 2016, the 9th Iraqi Army Armored Division advanced on Kiara from the south, while the 15th Iraqi Army Division pushed west from Mokmur. The airfield fell to the Iraqis in July, uh, followed by the city itself in late August. The U.S. Army, en US Army engineers oversaw the reconstruction of the facility, restoring it to full operating status by the beginning of September. They also built a new combined joint operations center, which would serve as a headquarters for the Iraqi troops and for their advisors. 
The attack to uh, seize Mosul kicked off on uh, October 17th, 2016. After a short advance by the Peshmerga, the ISF uh, passed through the Kurdish lines and moved towards the city's outskirts. And here is the basic plan for the initial attack. Uh, you can see the different axes uh, from the northeast, from the east, from the southeast, and one proceeding directly from the south. Uh, these all consisting of Iraqi security forces units. And you also see this odd one shooting off to the uh, northwest, uh, which consists of the uh, popular mobilization forces militias. Uh, they were sent uh, out towards Tal Afar rather than towards Mosul uh, in an effort to, uh, to ensure that there would not be any, um, any incidents where the, uh, the Shia militias that composed the PMF had committed atrocities against Sunni civilians. And it would be obviously counterproductive uh, for them to, to go into uh, Mosul and potentially do that there. So during the months and weeks leading up to the offensive, uh, coalition airstrikes had pummeled the city, um, uh, softening up defensive positions, killing ISIS commanders and destroying important infrastructure. Uh, but despite being weakened, ISIS put up stiff resistance on all fronts during the opening phase of the battle. The ISF and the Peshmerga suffered a total of 500 casualties, including 180 soldiers killed in action during the first two weeks alone. Uh, having made much more rapid progress uh, than the other ISF elements, the CTS-led axis, uh, the uh, black arrow uh, uh, going from east to west here, uh, breached the city on uh, November 1st. During the following month, it fought against ISIS's forces uh, with minimal support from the rest of the Iraqi military and uh, suffered heavy losses as a result. By the end of November, the offensive was at a virtual standstill. Uh, and here we see advising in action. These are uh, U.S. advisors working with Iraqi uh, forces in the in the north of Mosul. Uh, so in early December, the uh, 9th Iraqi Army Armored Division, uh, which was proceeding uh, from the southwest to the to uh, from the southeast to the northwest um, into southeast Mosul, um, attempted to regain the initiative by launching a Thunder Run style drive against Al Salam Hospital. Uh, which was a medical facility that uh, overlooked much of the surrounding cityscape from a point about three kilometers behind ISIS's front lines. So an assault by uh, two mechanized battalions caught the terrorist group by surprise and captured the hospital almost without a fight. Uh, one Iraqi officer later informed reporters that, quote, we thought they had, uh, ISIS had fled. Um, but the Iraqi, uh, but the Islamic State's leaders had no intention of abandoning their position at the hospital. Uh, less than four hours later, uh, the terrorist group counterattacked with six uh, SV bids, wounding 18 Iraqi soldiers and setting a BMP-1 infantry fighting vehicle on fire. Before the Iraqis could react, the flames spread to other vehicles that were parked uh, far too close uh, to the BMP, um, rapidly damaging or destroying uh, much of the battalion's transportation. At this point, many of the Iraqis opted to shelter in the northwest corner of one of the hospital buildings which they converted into a strong point. At the same time, an Iraqi squad, uh, sorry, an ISIS squad pushed forward into an adjacent eight-story hospital building and engaged the Iraqi soldiers with small arms fire. Other ISIS elements from throughout East Mosul also rushed to join the battle. Some fighters even engaged the, uh, the battalion's remaining vehicles with anti-tank weapons, causing the Iraqis to abandon them and seek safety within the hospital building. Coalition airstrikes inflicted some casualties, but did not cause the terrorist group to withdraw. And here's what the hospital looked like in 2008. Uh, this gives a sense of the, uh, the size of the structure. So as night fell, the Iraqis improvised a plan to relieve the, uh, the two besieged battalions. On uh, December 7th, two CTS elements redeployed to, uh, to support the 9th Armored Division. The CTS units advanced towards the besieged force beginning in mid-afternoon, approaching to within 200 meters of the hospital complex before being pinned down by heavy fire. At that point, ISIS made a final desperate attempt to destroy the Iraqi force. An SV bid detonated near the Iraqi defensive position in the hospital complex, followed by a barrage of 20 rocket-propelled grenades, which set part of the facility on fire. Around 80 of the survivors then evacuated the building and fought their way back to the CTS lines. 
When we reached them, quote, they barely had any bullets left, noted one Iraqi commando. Having united the two forces, then withdrew back to the 9th Armored Division's lines, where the ill-fated assault had started from the day before. Three square kilometers of southeast Mosul had been uh, liberated and then abandoned in less than 48 hours. Iraqi casualties were heavy. 13 soldiers from the 9th Armored Division were killed and a further 48 were wounded during the battle. Equipment losses were also severe. Uh, no less than 13 BMPs and five Humvees were destroyed or abandoned. Uh, that is an entire Iraqi battalion's worth of vehicles. Uh, some even fell into ISIS's hands. For its, parts, uh, for its part, ISIS had lost uh, between 70 and 100 fighters, partly to coalition airstrikes. Uh, now the battle for the hospital came as a serious blow to the Iraqi effort to liberate Mosul. In the aftermath, the Iraqi security forces initiated a two week operational pause on all axes at uh, the urging of CJTF OIR in order to bring in supplies and reinforcements. For General Townsend commanding OIR, uh, the engagement underscored the need uh, for coalition advisors to take a more active role in supporting their Iraqi partners. CJTF OIR tactical directive number one, enabling coalition support to partner forces issued by Townsend's headquarters on December 22nd, loosened certain restrictions on coalition ground forces that had been in place since 2014. It enabled the commanders of coalition advise and assist teams, including company commanders, to approve requests for airstrikes on their own authority. Previously, all airstrikes were subject to approval from a pair of one-star generals located either in Baghdad or Erbil. Uh, the uh, directive also allowed advisors to accompany their partners close to the front lines, a privilege that had previously been confined to special operations forces. This made advising Iraqi brigades, the ISF's principal tactical formation, uh, much more viable. Uh, these changes had an almost immediate impact. Assured that they would enjoy more responsive support from the coalition, uh, the Iraqis returned to the attack on uh, December 29th, advancing on three axes simultaneously. Forced to defend everywhere at once for the first time since Operation Eagle Strike began, uh, ISIS could do little to counter the Iraqis. By January 15th, the uh, CTS had captured Mosul University, and, uh, and uh, that was the last ISIS stronghold east of the Tigris. The Iraqi Prime Minister announced the liberation of East Mosul on uh, January 24th. This was an important achievement. Uh, however, despite taking 99 days and costing the ISF over 1,200 casualties, the battle to liberate East Mosul had been a relatively straightforward, even easy uh, affair compared with what was to come. The assault on West Mosul would not begin for several weeks as the Iraqis rested, resupplied, and uh, redeployed their forces. A new US Army rotation also arrived as Colonel Pat Works 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 82nd Airborne Division, uh, replaced Colonel Brett Sylvia's 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne Division, as the coalition's principal advisory and training task force. Major General Joseph Martin's 1st Infantry Division had replaced Major General Gary Valeski's 101st Airborne Division as OIR's Ground Component Command in November. In the interim, during the night of uh, February 2nd, ISIS made a daring but ill-advised attempt to regain the initiative, uh, sending an assault force of around 50 fighters across the Tigris into East Mosul. 21 of the militants set up a firing position, while two groups of 15 fighters moved forward to assault the Iraqis' defensive positions. Coalition forces saw all this via surveillance imagery, and as usual, were impressed with the militants' skillful employment of, of small unit tactics. However, a well-timed attack run by an A-10 Thunderbolt II stopped them in their tracks, killing 45 and wounding a further four before they could launch their attack. Coalition forces also sank the six boats that the uh, surviving fighters used to flee across the Tigris. This was the last significant attempt by ISIS forces to reestablish a foothold across the river. The operation to liberate Mosul's western half finally opened on February 19th. While the federal police and the CTS advanced north in parallel, as you can see uh, in the south here, 
uh, the uh, 9th Iraqi Army Armored Division swung northwest away from Mosul and then northeast towards the Tigris, cutting off ISIS's last line of supply and escape route. Uh, and here you can see uh, the, the Iraqi armor, um, an Iraqi armored column moving towards West Mosul, and it, it shows just how eclectic uh, our, our Iraqi equipment could be with an M1 Abrams, uh, some uh, Soviet, uh, you know, Eastern Bloc uh, vehicles, uh, and some uh, Humvees all mixed together. Uh, now, the Iraqis made rapid progress, but they also suffered heavily, especially due to ISIS's innovative use of consumer-grade quadcopter drones, which attacked in swarms and dropped grenades on unsuspecting ISF personnel. Uh, now, pictured here, this is not uh, from Mosul, but these do show the types of drones that ISIS was using. Uh, you could just buy them in a store. Uh, now, the Iraqis, with uh, help from their American advisors, came up with a range of responses to this threat. One of the most effective was a purpose-built system which uh, US advisors mounted on flatbed uh, trucks. Um, and uh, this jams specific radio frequencies as well as the GPS antennae on uh, ISIS's drones, which caused them either to uh, just drop out of the air or either uh, for certain models to uh, turn right around and return to their operators. Uh, with this and other countermeasures, ISIS's uh, you know, rudimentary air force was effectively neutralized by the end of February. The terrorist group nevertheless held out doggedly. Uh, between uh, February 18th and May 3rd, an average of 46 Iraqi soldiers were killed or wounded every day, uh, almost four times the Iraqis' casualty rate in East Mosul. This was a result of the strength of the old city as a defensive position, as well as ISIS's frequent counterattacks, uh, which often took advantage of the terrorist group's underground tunnel network. In one such attack on March 15th, an ISIS front-end loader uh, SV bid breached the Iraqis' defensive position before exploding, killing two federal police officers and wounding 20 more. The attack also destroyed several vehicles, including a T-72 tank and four Humvees. Four days later, militants ambushed and captured a federal police battalion commander together with his entire security detail, all of whom were later found dead. And a uh, picture here are uh, Iraqi federal police uh, officers being uh, advised by US forces. You can tell they're federal police by their distinctive blue camouflage. Uh, to help the Iraqis move forward, advisors made increasing use of air power and ISIS in turn resorted to increasingly desperate measures to counter it, including attempts to engineer mass civilian casualty incidents. Uh, in one case, an, I an ISIS sniper team engaged CTS forces from a building in which a large number of civilians were sheltering. Um, and ISIS did this in the apparent hopes of provoking an airstrike. A coalition bomb did in fact kill the sniper team, but it also detonated other explosives that the terrorist group had hidden in the building. And uh, between 101 and 137 civilians died as a result. Uh, this uh, is a schematic of one floor of the building in question from a, uh, a, a, a study undertaken by the CJTFOIR, an investigation after this incident. Uh, and it was released via the Freedom of Information Act. While a massacre on this scale was unusual, coalition airstrikes did uh, kill innocents with, with tragic regularity, roughly two per day during the battle for West Mosul, according to official assessments. The true figure may in fact be several times higher. Uh, according to one estimate, as many as 10,000 civilians died uh, during the battle for Mosul. Uh, one third is a result of strikes by Iraqi or coalition aircraft. By April, uh, stiff resistance had again brought the offensive to a standstill. The ISF waited for a month before launching its final assault on the few neighborhoods still under ISIS's control. And you can see this small stretch of territory along the Tigris River that ISIS controlled at this point in the battle. Uh, by the end of May, ISIS's position was reduced to three neighborhoods. Uh, the terrorist group had less than 1,000 fighters in the city. Um, however, as many as 100,000 civilians remained in areas uh, under ISIS's control as the group prevented residents from following the Iraqi government's instructions to evacuate Mosul. ISIS fighters, in fact, uh, often took pot shots at would-be refugees 
and in a series of massacres between May 26th and June 3rd, killed more than 231 civilians in a, a single neighborhood near the hospital complex noted in this map. Aware that airstrikes would be of limited utility amid such a high concentration of non-combatants, General Townsend granted coalition troops permission to use certain direct fire weapons like sniper rifles and uh, anti-tank guided missiles in support of the ISF uh, beginning in the first week of June. During that month, uh, the fighting in West Mosul centered around the Al Jamuri Hospital Complex, a modern medical facility that marked the northernmost point of uh, ISIS's shrinking zone of, shrinking zone of control. Uh, situated on the high ground, the, the complex included high-rise buildings, some as tall as 11 stories, that overlooked the uh, surrounding cityscape. ISIS used the facility as an observation point, headquarters, weapons cache, uh, and fighting position. Recognizing its importance, Iraqi forces made several unsuccessful attempts to capture it during the first week of June, suffering heavy losses. Uh, the Iraqis then shifted their advance to the south, bypassing the hospital in an effort to reach the Tigris River and split ISIS's remaining territory in two. In the midst of this fighting, the Islamic State launched another major counterattack against the federal police units south of the old city, infiltrating 85 fighters behind the Iraqi lines using sewers, uh, canals, and their own tunnel system. The federal police suffered 90 casualties in this engagement, including 20 uh, police officers killed in action. However, almost the entire ISIS force was destroyed. Although damaging, the counterattack failed to derail operations to the north. On uh, June 20th, Iraqi troops reached the Tigris from the rest, uh, from the west, isolating the ISIS outpost at Al Jamari Hospital. The federal police then assaulted the hospital once again on June 25th, entering the complex uh, before withdrawing under heavy fire from ISIS machine guns and rocket propellant grenades. After pinpointing the location of ISIS's headquarters, the coalition carried out several airstrikes on sites in and around the hospital on June 30th. The federal police then stormed the facility, raising the Iraqi flag over the largest building in the complex on the morning of July 1st. While the battle for Al Jamari Hospital raged to the north, the CTS continued to push into the old city. With the Iraqi commandos approaching within 60 meters of their position, ISIS fighters detonated explosives in the Grand Mosque of Al-Nuri on June 21st, destroying the 800-year-old landmark. The Iraqis reached the ruins on June 28th. On the left is what it looked like from the air uh, in 2017, when, it, when the actual uh, destruction took place. On the right is what it looked like a year later uh, from the ground. Now, 11 days after this, the Iraqi prime minister flew into Mosul to announce the city's liberation, prematurely as it turned out. In the afternoon of July 10th, around 200 ISIS fighters strapped on suicide vests and emerged from the basements and tunnels where they had been hiding in the ruins of the old city. Uh, many disguised themselves as women or feigned surrender in an attempt to get as close as possible to Iraqi troops before detonating their explosives. The ruse failed. By the end of the day, around 140 of the fighters were dead. Within a week, the last small section of the city had fallen to Iraqi forces. Bulldozers accompanied Iraqi infantry during the final assault a week later, interring would-be suicide bombers beneath the rubble. The final phase of the battle had been particularly bloody for the Iraqis, costing the ISF 3,710 casualties in just two and a half months, a rate of more than 50 casualties per day. With nowhere to go, the ISIS fighters in Mosul fought to the end, and there were no mass surrenders. In the aftermath, a series of rapid ISF offensives liberated the last significant ISIS-held population centers within Iraqi territory. The Iraqi Prime Minister declared victory over the Islamic State in December 2017. This, uh, the green area is shown here is what was liberated while the 18th Airborne Corps uh, was operating as CJCF OIR headquarters, uh, which concluded in August uh, of 2017. And between August and December, other areas such as the region around Huija and uh, the rest of the, the red area in the Euphrates River Valley, uh, that was all liberated. 
uh, areas in Syria, of course, remain uh, under ISIS's control. But for Iraq, major operations uh, were at an end. Now, there were still thousands of ISIS fighters on Iraqi soil, and uh, the Syrian half of the caliphate would hold out for another 15 months until March 2019. Uh, but ISIS had poured enormous resources into the fight for Mosul, and the city's loss was a heavy blow from which the terrorist organization really still hasn't recovered. In that sense, it was, as one commentator has pointed out, a true decisive battle. Uh, the battle for Mosul was above all an Iraqi victory. Uh, two members of CJTFOIR were killed while supporting Operation Eagle Strike, uh, compared with 1,320 members of the Iraqi security forces in Kurdish Peshmerga. While Iraqi leaders did take advice, they were not in any sense under coalition command. Their decision-making on all levels was highly independent. Uh, quote, we oftentimes don't know what they're going to do until they do it, uh, commented one U.S. commander. The extent of advisors' influence over their Iraqi partners depended to a large degree on their ability to summon coalition airstrikes and surface-to-surface -surface fires. Our partners have become addicted to our capabilities, amid one advisor. Iraqi troops sometimes refuse to advance without proof that they would have support from coalition firepower. In response, advisors resorted to what they called motivational fires, calling in strikes on innocuous terrain features along the route of a planned Iraqi advance. Tactically, these fires did not always make sense, noted one American report, uh, but proved to be the baseline for initiating most actions. Ultimately, around 1,500 airstrikes by fixed-wing aircraft were carried out over the course of the battle, many of which included numerous individual engagements. Uh, helicopters and ground-based artillery uh, also carried out many strikes. This firepower undoubtedly played a key role in bringing about the, uh, the Iraqis' ultimate victory. Uh, it was instrumental in breaking up ISIS's frequent counterattacks, and it helped to uh, reduce formidable strong points like the Aljamari Hospital Complex, uh, but it also had negative consequences. Uh, used on a massive scale, so-called so precision munitions actually left Mosul utterly desolated, uh, quote, reminiscent of European cities destroyed during the course of World War II, uh, in the words of one American report. In addition to the civilian casualties already noted, over 40,000 homes were destroyed in West Mosul alone. Uh, heavy use of precision guided munitions also aid into the United States reserves of such weapons, uh, leaving uh, strategic shortages that were still evident uh, two years later. Finally, it fostered an unhealthy dependence on US support on the part of the Iraqis. Uh, one South Vietnamese general observed a similar phenomenon during the Easter offensive in 1972. Quote, since uh, U.S. air support was so effective and always available, he wrote, uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam tactical commanders tended to uh, disregard their own supporting weapons, which were seldom used properly. Eventually, the tendency to rely on B-52s or tactical air in the place of organic fire and maneuver became so commonplace that it inhibited initiative and often caused delays in conducting attacks, end quote. These comments might have been taken verbatim from advisors uh, in Mosul. In the end, it is unclear whether the success of Eagle Strike uh, fully vindicates the proxy warfare operational approach used during the conflict with ISIS to legitimate to legitimize its claim to being a state. ISIS had to fight like one, uh, fielding a combined arms army. Uh, to be sure, this characteristic made it very effective on the battlefield. A semi-conventional force that was, in one analyst's assessment, considerably better than most Arab armies of the modern era, state or non-state. But the same characteristics, which enabled ISIS's early victories, also made the group uniquely vulnerable to American air power. It is unclear whether the approach adopted by the US government, that is a combination of special operations forces, conventional advisory teams and firepower would be equally effective against a, a different enemy. Okay, Mason, thank you very much. Appreciate it, uh, especially the maps. Uh, very good uh, illustrations as well. Thanks for that. Uh, we have a, a few questions, if you will indulge us in that. Um, <clears throat> one of them uh, is via email, which is, uh, where does this, uh, the, the book that this is based on that, that, that you have just completed, uh, where does that fit in with the Center of Military History's uh, 
other publications or future publications? Is this a series or what, what else, what else is coming from CMH? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is part of a series of monographs. It's the second one published in the, in the series of uh, U.S. Army campaigns in Iraq. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nick Schlosser's uh, uh, monograph on the Iraq surge in 2007-2008 uh, has also already been published. Um, and there are other uh, entries in, in this series in the works. Uh, so they're all uh, shorter studies that are intended to be uh, you know, good introductions to the, to the subject. Great, thank you. Uh, let's give it another few questions. Uh, uh, one of our um, Army, uh, retired Army historians asks, what was the process of requesting U.S. fires? Uh, well, so like I, like I noted, it changes during, during the battle. Um, but uh, so the, the, the detail of process, um, basically, ultimately, uh, advisors on the scene uh, could be very responsive to what was happening after tactical directive number one. Um, so if uh, a, uh, the uh, Iraqi units requested fire support, uh, even, a, even a captain could be able to say, yeah, sure, uh, go ahead. And a strike could be carried out uh, almost immediately. Uh, before that went into effect, uh, it, was, it was a bit more cumbersome in that um, everything had to be vetted by, uh, um, by strike cells located in uh, Erbil and, um, and uh, Baghdad, uh, either, either uh, location. Uh, now, that isn't to say that strikes after tactical directive one weren't uh, weren't all vetted, but the approval process was just shortened. Um, incidentally, of course, the Iraqis also had to sign off on every strike. Uh, it, it is Iraq, and and, and uh, U.S. forces were there at the invitation of the Iraqi government. Um, now, during most of the battle, uh, very low-level Iraqi commanders could give that uh, that approval, but uh, almost immediately after the battle ended, uh, the Iraqis withdrew approval authority up to a higher level. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we have another question. Uh, what could have been done differently to have prevented the rise of ISIS after the U.S. withdrawal? Well, that's a that's a great question, and there are a lot of there have been a lot of attempts to to answer that. I mean, uh, the um, now, so I, I I'll say this. I think it's remarkable how quickly the Iraqi security forces went from. Uh, it went, uh, became almost completely ineffective. Uh, it just took two years, essentially, uh, after we left, which, you know, kind of raises the question, were they ever, I mean, how good were they, were they ever if, if it only takes two years? Um, now, uh, a lot of what was wrong with them was due to meddling um, to the politi politicization of the Iraqi security forces by the prime minister at the time, uh, Prime Minister uh, Maliki, uh, who replaced competent commanders with his own um, uh, supporters. Uh, so, and, and also he uh, promoted Shia interests at the expense of Shia, uh, Sunnis. Uh, so he, he in, in effect created a lot of problems for the, for the Iraqi military. It's possible we could have, we could have uh, that there might've been a way that we could have influenced that process and, and, and slowed it down. But the main issue is the fact that we just, we had withdrawn and the Iraqis didn't want us there. Uh, the Iraqis were very happy that we went home in December 2011, and uh, and really in America we were we were also pretty happy to have left. There really wasn't a large constituency on either side um, for uh, a large American presence in Iraq, which really seems to be what would have been needed to to arrest the the problems that uh, ultimately led to the the Iraqi security forces falling apart. Uh, the other thing is the situation in Syria. Uh, maybe there would have been a way. Uh, to prevent Syria from from collapsing essentially into into uh, civil war, leading to uh, you know this this large area in, in the eastern part of the country uh, where there was no central government, uh, that was just the perfect uh, space for a group like uh, ISIS to uh, to uh, set up its its base and gain recruits. Um, so uh, possibly a different way of handling the civil war, uh, but it's it's again it's a situation that that. Uh, it's hard to, to think of really what, what could have been done differently. 
Okay, another question here uh, regarding ISIS is, uh, was there a significant number of people coming from other countries to fight for ISIS? Yeah, yeah, there were tens of thousands of foreign fighters. Uh, and the foreign fighters were, uh, they were among the most motivated ISIS fighters. They weren't necessarily the most skilled, um, but they made great suicide, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And in Mosul, they were the ones who really fought to the bitter end, uh, partly because they knew that they couldn't blend back into the, the local population. Either they didn't speak the language or at least they didn't know the dialect. Uh, and, uh, and so they uh, didn't really have any choice. Okay, well, it looks like we have one more. Uh, did the change of US administration in January, 2017, have any influence on the campaign? Yeah, that's a good question too. And, and that is a subject that uh, it's, it'll be possible to say more as more information comes out, as more memoirs from the, the Trump administration come out. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I offer a preliminary answer to that in the monograph, um, which is that essentially the strategy that we're pursuing uh, against ISIS in, in Mosul that's all really, that's already established and it doesn't change in any significant way. Uh, even the, the tactical directive that, uh, that expands um, the authorities granted to, to US ground commanders, uh, you know, that, that, that came into effect before the administration's change. Um, there's a shift in rhetoric. Uh, so, um, you know, on, when when um, uh, you know General Mattis becomes Secretary of Defense, he begins talking about uh, the annihilation of ISIS, emphasizing that uh, as opposed to just defeat. Um, and you could connect that to to what we ultimately do in West Mosul, which is we don't give ISIS an opportunity to flee. Uh, in other cities like Ramadi and Fallujah, uh, and in Syria, this happens too. Uh, ISIS forces are often given an escape route uh, because it's a lot easier to bomb a, a column of, of uh, pickup trucks on the road uh, than to, to root, uh, you know, hard, hardened fighters out of basements in, a, in an urban area. Uh, but we don't do that in Mosul. Um, and that isn't purely our decision. That's also the Iraqis' decision. So it's, I, I can't, um, with, with the limited information as yet available, uh, it's hard to give a definitive answer to that. Uh, one more question here. With what happened to the Iraqi army after the U.S. left, and then how quickly the Afghan army collapsed when the U.S. left, does this indicate that the policy of training and other nations' forces just doesn't work, or is there a better way to do it than we have in the past? Um, well, I, I think it's fair to say that the United States hasn't had a great record in the past 70 or so years with security force assistance. Uh, we've done a pretty good job in the more distant past. The, uh, the Republic of Korea Army Korea. is a great success story. Um, but I, I mean, I, I, I think the evidence sort of speaks for itself in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, that we haven't done. Uh, that there have been problems with, with how we approached it. Um, now in, in Operation Inherent Resolve, potentially that, that represents a turning point, that we've done things somewhat differently. Uh, we've resisted the temptation to step in and do things ourselves um, just simply because we couldn't, because we didn't have ground troops, which meant that we had to do things the Iraqis way. Um, and that often meant doing it in a less efficient way. It's a way that we wouldn't necessarily do it according to our own doctrine. Um, but in the end, they, they did get the job done. And so maybe that is a better approach. Thanks very much for, for joining us this evening uh, to talk with Dr. Mason Watson for the U.S. Army Center of Military History. Mason Watson, thanks so much for being with us uh, this evening. We enjoyed it. And uh, as I mentioned, we don't get uh, much on, on the modern topic. So very glad to add this to our collection. And we're uh, glad you took time to be with us. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks again, John. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. And uh, thanks to everyone for, uh, for attending. Great. Okay, audience members, thanks again. Uh, Kenna, our producer, thanks. And we'll see you at the next program.